I'm Sushil Gachwani. Not long ago, I came to one of those bleak periods that many of us encounter from time to time. A sudden drastic dip in the graph of living when everything goes tail and flat. Energy wanes and enthusiasm dies. The effect on my work was frightening. Every morning I would clench my teeth and mutter. Today life will take on some of its old meaning. You got to break through this thing. You got to. But, but the barren days went by and the paralysis grew worse. The time came when I knew I had to have help. The man I turned to was a doctor. Not a psychiatrist, just a doctor. He was older than I and under his surface gruffness lay great wisdom and compassion. I told him miserably, I don't know what's wrong with me, I don't know, but I just seem to have come to a dead end. Can you help me? He said softly, I don't know. He made a tent of his fingers and gazed at me thoughtfully for a while. Then abruptly he asked, Where were you happiest as a child? I echoed, As a child? Why, at the beach, I suppose. We had a summer cottage there. We all loved it. We all enjoyed it. He looked out of the window and watched the October leaves sifting down. Are you capable of following instructions for a single day? I was ready to try anything and I said, I think so, sir. All right, here's what I want you to do. The doctor told me to drive to the beach alone the following morning, arriving not later than 9 o'clock. I could take some lunch, but I was not to read, not to write, not to listen to the radio or talk to anyone. In addition, he said, I'll give you a prescription to be taken every three hours. The doctor tore off four prescription blanks, wrote a few words on each, folded them, numbered them and handed them to me. Take these at 9, 12, 3 and 6. Is that okay? I asked him, are you serious? He gave a short bark of a laugh. <laughs> You won't think I'm joking when you get my bill. The next morning, with little feet, I drove to the beach. It was lonely, all right. A northeaster was blowing. The sea looked grey and angry. I sat in the car, the whole day stretching emptily before me. Then I took out the first of the folded slips of paper. On it was written, Listen carefully. I stared at the two words. Listen carefully. Why? I thought the man must be mad. He must be crazy. He had ruled out music and news broadcasts and human conversation. What else was there? I raised my head and I did listen. There were no sounds but the steady roar of the sea, the creaking cry of a gull, the drone of some aircraft high overhead. All these sounds were familiar. I got out of the car. A gust of wind slammed the door with a sudden clap of sound. Am I supposed to listen carefully to things like that? I asked myself. I climbed a dune and looked out over the deserted beach. Here the sea bellowed so loudly that all other sounds were lost. And yet, I thought suddenly there must be sounds beneath sounds, the soft rasp of drifting sand, the tiny wind whisperings in the dune grasses if the listener got close enough to hear them. On an impulse I ducked down and, feeling faintly ridiculous, thrust my head into a clump of seaweed. Here I made a discovery. If you listen intently, there is a fractional moment in which everything seems to pause, wait. In that instant of stillness, the racing thoughts halt. For a moment, when you truly listen for something outside yourself, you have to silence the clamorous voices within. The mind 
comes to a rest. I went to the car and slid behind the wheel. Listen carefully. As I listened again to the deep growl of the sea, I found myself thinking about the immensity of it, the stupendous rhythms of it, the velvet trap it made for moonlight, the white-fanged fury of its storms. I thought of the lessons it had taught us as children. A certain amount of patience. You can't hurry the tides. A great deal of respect. The sea does not suffer fools gladly. An awareness of the vast and mysterious interdependence of things, wind, tide and current, calm and squall and hurricane, all combining to determine the paths of the birds above and the fish below. And the cleanness of it all, with every beach swept twice a day by the great broom of the sea. Sitting there, I realized I was thinking of things bigger than myself, and there was relief in that. Even so, the morning passed slowly. The habit of hurling myself at a problem was so strong that I felt lost without it. Once, when I was wistfully eyeing the car radio, a phrase from Carlyle jumped into my head. Silence is the element in which great things fashion themselves. By noon, the wind had polished the clouds out of the sky and the sea had a hard, merry sparkle. I unfolded the second prescription and again I sat there, half amused and half exasperated. Three words this time. Try reaching back. Back to what? To the past, obviously. But why, when all my worries concern the present or the future? I left the car and started trampling reflectively along the dunes. The doctor had sent me to the beach because it was a place of happy memories. Maybe that was what I was supposed to reach for, the wealth of happiness that lay half forgotten behind me. I found a sheltered place and lay down on the sun-warmed sand. When I tried to peer into the veil of the past, the recollections that came to the surface were happy but not very clear. The faces were faint and far away, as if I had not thought of them in a long time. I decided to experiment, to work on these vague impressions as a painter would, retouching its colors, strengthening the outlines. I would choose specific incidents and recapture as many details as possible. I would visualize people complete with dress and gestures. I would listen carefully for the exact sound of their voices, the echo of their laughter. The tide was going out now, but there was still thunder in the surf. So I chose to go back 20 years to the last fishing trip I made with my younger brother. I found now that if I closed my eyes and really tried, I could see him with amazing vividness, even the humor and eagerness in his eyes that far off morning. In fact, I could see it all, the eastern sky smeared with Sunrise, the great roller screaming in stately and slow. I could feel the back wash swirl warm around my knees, see the sudden arc of my brother's rod as he struck a fish, hear his exultant yell. Piece by piece, I built it, clear and unchanged under the transparent varnish of time. Then it was gone. I sat up slowly, try reaching back. Happy people were usually assured confident people. If they knew deliberately reached back and touched happiness, might there not be released little flashes of power, tiny sources of strength? The second period of the day went more quickly. As the sun began its long slant down the sky, my mind ranged eagerly through the past, reliving some episodes, uncovering others that had been completely forgotten. For example, when I was around 13 and my brother 10, father had promised to take us to the circus. But at lunch, there was a phone call. Some urgent business required his attention in office. We braced ourselves for disappointment. Then we heard our father say, No, I won't come to office. The problem will have to wait. When he came back to the table, mother smiled. The circus keeps coming back, you know. I know, but childhood doesn't. Across all the years, I remembered this 
and know from the sudden glow of warmth that no kindness is ever really wasted or ever completely lost. By three o'clock, the tide was out. The sound of the waves was only a rhythmic whisper, like a giant breathing. I stayed in my sandy nest, feeling relaxed and content, a little complacent. The doctor's prescriptions, I thought, were easy to take, but I was not prepared for the next one. This time, the three words were not a gentle suggestion at all; they sounded more like a command. Re-examine your motives. Re-examine your motives. My first reaction was purely defensive. There's nothing wrong with my motives. I said to myself, "I want to be successful. Who doesn't? I want a certain amount of recognition, but so does everybody. I want more security than I have got. But why not?" Maybe, said a small voice somewhere inside my head. Those motives aren't good enough. Maybe that's the reason the wheels have stopped going round. I picked up a handful of sand and let it stream between my fingers. In the past, whenever my work went well, there had always been something, something spontaneous about it, something uncontrived, something free. Lately, it had been calculated, competent, and dead. Why? Because I had been looking past the job itself to the rewards I hoped. it would bring the work had ceased to be an end in itself it had been merely a means to make money pay bills the sense of giving something of helping people of making a contribution had been lost in a frantic clutch at security in a flash of certainty i saw that if once motives are wrong nothing can be right it makes no difference whether you are a postman a hairdresser an insurance agent a doctor an engineer a media person a housewife whatever as long as you feel you are serving others you do the job well when you are concerned only with helping yourself you do it less well this is a law as inexorable as the law of gravity for a long time i sat there far out on the bar i heard the murmur of the surf change to a hollow roar as the tide turned Behind me the spears of light were almost horizontal my time at the beach had almost run out and i felt a grudging admiration for the doctor and the prescriptions he had so casually and so cunningly devised i saw now that in them was a therapeutic progression of value to anyone facing any difficulty the first prescription was listen very carefully to calm the frantic mind slow it down shift the focus from inner problems to outer things the second one was try reaching back since the human mind can hold out but one idea at a time you blot out present worry when you touch the happiness of the past the third prescription was reexamine your motives this was the heart core of the treatment this challenge to reappraise to bring one's motives into alignment with one's capabilities and conscience but the mind must be clear and receptive to do this hence the six hours of quiet that went before the western sky was a blaze of crimson as i as i took out the last slip of paper six words this time i walked slowly out on the beach a few meters below high water mark i stopped and read the words again and this was doctor's fourth prescription write your worries on the sand write your worries on the sand i let the paper blow away reached down and picked up a fragment of shell kneeling there under the vault of the sky i wrote several words on the sand one about the other then i walked away and i did not look back i had written my troubles on the sand and the tide was coming in my dear friends when we look at our life always remember four things listen very carefully try reaching back reexamine your motives and write your worries on the sand 
and live a happy life because life is beautiful this is your friend sushil gajwani wishing you a wonderful life a beautiful life goodbye